we're going to go, uh, we're going to stay in New York, but we're going to go across uh, the uh, East River into another borough, leave Manhattan and go over into uh, Brooklyn and we're going to look at uh, some work there and Trevor's going to take us to the uh, river. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking um, my chair, Jamie Tillman, and uh, of course, Carl Lupuy, and thank you all for coming today. Um, this thesis, Urban Being, Enhancing Urban Ecology Through the Cross-Pollination of Architecture and Agriculture. Um, so today, I'm going to go through um, the issues that we've been seeing recently, um, the concept of urban agriculture, um, the site, and, and the building. Um, so bees are um, essential to our ecosystems. Um, they're the chief pollinators globally, um, and they provide the key eco ecological services um, that promote agricultural uh, production as well as um, biodiversity. Um, so 75% of the uh, fruit, nuts, and vegetables that we eat as Americans are pollinated by bees. Um, and some foods, such as almonds, are only pollinated by bees. So 100% of almonds need bees to be um, to, to grow. Um, others, such as apples, onions, carrots, um, rely on uh, bees for 90% of their uh, pollination. Um, so due to our kind of dependence on um, bees for this pollination effort, um, it's estimated that in the U.S., um, the economic value of bees is $15 billion annually. Um, there's a, a, a worrying trend that we've seen recently. Um, uh, since 2006, one-third of uh, bees have been lost in the U.S. Um, and so this is very uh, uh, concerning due to how much humans rely on bees. Um, and so a, a normal winter loss is, is common. Uh, around 15% of uh, a colony uh, will be lost. Um, but recently we've been moving well beyond that threshold. Um, some years moving beyond double that to, to 30% and more. Um, in rural landscapes where most agriculture um, takes place, um, bees like an uninterrupted landscape with a lot of biodiversity. Um, as insensitive development comes in and commercial agriculture um, takes over the land, uh, bees have to have become fragmented. Um, this puts a lot of stress on bees and there's a reduced level of um, biodiversity as uh, monocultural uh, kind of wipes out a lot of the plant diversity. Um, and then on top of that, uh, commercial agriculture relies a lot on um, uh, pesticides and herbicides, which are very poisonous to bees, and is a, is a big reason why bees are um, dying off. And unfortunately, bees can't, can't wear the same uh, protective equipment that we can, and they end up like our friend here on the right. Um, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, to, to combat some of the issues of, of rural agriculture, um, this thesis looks at how we can promote the increasing trend of urban agriculture, um, which bees in urban areas have actually been proven to, to be healthier um, and have higher survival rates in urban areas. Um, this is due to higher levels of pollen and nectar uh, diversity. Um, as well as uh, reduced uh, levels of uh, pesticides and chemicals that are harmful to bees. Um, so urban beekeeping is a uh, rising um, in popularity. Um, humans and bees have a relationship that dates back 9,000 years to when humans first started um, uh, growing crops. Um, and urban beekeeping is bringing that human uh, bee alliance into the 21st century. Um, so beekeeping is growing in popularity largely due because or urban beekeeping is growing in popularity largely due to um, cities relaxing their laws um, and allowing beekeeping to take place in these cities. So in New York City, for example, they legalized beekeeping in 2011, and there are already currently hundreds of hives throughout the city. Um, the architecture of hives has evolved throughout time. Um, originally, uh, hives were using natural materials um, that were kind of altered um, and through time they've become more sophisticated. Um, the the Langstroth hive which is shown here um, 
uh, uses supers, um, which holds frames where bees will actually um, fill the honey of the frame, cap it with wax, um, and then additional supers can be added on top of that as colonies grow. Um, and so with a, an architecture that provides space for education and research, um, for, uh, to promote ap apicultural processes, um, this thesis can um, improve interaction and awareness of the issues of bees, as well as um, improve um, and enhance the biodiversity of urban areas and increase uh, and improve the resiliency of the area. Um, so where are we going to test this? Um, this thesis chose the Guanas Canal, um, which is the most polluted body of water um, in the country. Um, it's uh, located on the western um, side of Brooklyn uh, to the south of Manhattan. Um, and when you zoom in, it sits between the residential neighborhoods of Carroll Gardens and Park Slope, and it's within one mile of Project Park. Um, the canal stretches 1.8 miles. Um, the scope of my project will only look at 1.2 miles of that, um, and that's just slightly less than walking the high line. Um, prior to being settled by the Dutch, um, the Gowanus Canal was a, a tidal creek um, and wetlands with streams running into it. Um, as the area got settled, um, the, the landscape transformed to become tidal mills, uh, farming, and oyster fishing. Um, in 1853, the canal was dredged um, and it soon became the, the primary industrial and commercial hub for Brooklyn. Um, since 19, 1950, um, with the um, advancement of automobile uh, shipping, the canal um, no longer sees as much activity as it, as it has. Um, and uh, it's, it's largely been left a polluted wasteland, uh, contaminated with uh, an assortment of toxins. Um, there's been a renewed interest in the canal um, recently. Uh, in 2010, um, the EPA designated the site a uh, Superfund site, um, which provided $506 million to clean up the, the canal. Um, and this includes uh, digging out the bottom of the canal, removing the, the contaminated site, um, and then and filling and capping the, the bottom of the canal with clay, uh, gravel, and sand um, to, to uh, keep the bottom of the contaminants that they don't remove uh, uh, contained. Um, on top of that, the, this area is susceptible to flooding. Um, it's very, uh, imper uh, imper uh, doesn't have a lot of permeable surfaces, um, uh, being a large industri post-industrial site. Um, and looking at the, the urban uh, fabric, um, the two surrounding neighborhoods have this tight-knit um, grid um, and then the, the uh, fabric of the um, industrial portion of Gowanus is very fragmented um, and it not, doesn't provide a lot of connection across the canal. Um, and when you look at the, the uh, character of the, the canal corridor itself, um, the edges are not very inviting. Um, they don't provide any public space. Uh, the canal is not really used as an amenity. Um, and largely due because uh, it's, it's very contaminated. Um, but as, as the canal gets cleaned out, um, I think there's a renewed interest in, in looking at this as an amenity. Um, and then you'll also notice that a lot of the buildings along the canal are the one or two story buildings, a lot of them vacant or um, underutilized. Um, and then notice here, uh, this is a new residential building that has popped up since uh, the EPA declared as a Superfund site, so there's, there's this renewed interest in, in developing along the canal. Um, so looking at the existing canal um, with the hard canal uh, bulkheads, um, this thesis looks to soften the canal edges, um, which will provide a, a park, public uh, urban park. Um, and as well as improve the urban ecology of the um, canal edge uh, and with wetlands. Um, the next step would be developing along the canal. Um, with the there's been a new proposed uh, zoning um, that hasn't been passed yet, but it has been proposed. Um, 
And so looking at uh, creating districts in the Upper Canal, creating a, a residential, mixed-use residential uh, neighborhood, um, and the Lower Canal, uh, re re retaining some of the um, commercial activity uh, with a, a working and office um, district, and then in the Middle Canal, uh, a, an educational core and a live work um, that kind of mediates the Upper and Lower Canal. Um, to, to mediate the urban uh, fabric to the new urban park, um, there's a esplanade that wraps the, the edge of the, the new soften edge, um, and then there's a, a network of paths that lead into um, the, the soften edge, so you can actually go in and access some of the, the programming within that. Um, at the fulcrum point along the canal um, is the site for the New York City Beekeepers Association uh, Apiculture, Apiculture Center. Um, uh, zooming in a little bit further, uh, the site has an apiary park to the to the west, um, so the plant is now rotated north this way. Um, an apiary park to the to the west, and a pollinator garden to the north. Um, and so the apiary park uh, includes a grid of these totemic um, observation hives, um, and these are a new kind of urban infrastructure um, where people can actually go in and look up and see um, some of the processes of what's happening in, in a beehive. Um, so now looking at the, the site from the north, um, the, the building was designed uh, to, as an L building that reaches out towards the canal and as well as into the landscape. Um, the building was then split into an informal education and a, a formal education and research uh, Two, two buildings, um, which were then bridged across on level two, um, creating a threshold that, that moves down into the landscape um, from the urban area. Um, and then inspired from uh, the architecture of hives, um, the, the program was then articulated um, through these volumetric uh, elements that are stacked. Um, and so now I'll walk you through the program. So on the, the education and research building, um, on, the, on the first floor you have honey and wax processing. Um, above that you have apiculture or educational lab, which um, will host education for uh, apprentices that are trying to learn how to uh, keep bees. Um, and there's research labs where professionals uh, with the New York City Beekeepers Association will actually conduct research on bee health. Um, and then there's a sequence of spaces um, in the, the public um, informal education part of the building. Um, the first being a lecture and gathering um, stadium seating kind of auditorium, um, which we will move up from the first floor uh, to, to the second floor. On the second floor, there's a hive exhibit. Um, there's an observation hive room. Then you'll move up to the third floor where there's a rotating exhibit. Uh, pollination exhibit, uh, honey and wax exhibit, and it will end with a, a honey tasting room. Um, the rooftop uh, has pollinator roof gardens um, and a rooftop apiary. Um, and with that, I'd like to open up with questions. Thank you. Can you just talk a little, I mean, great, like I love the, the beginning, the kind of set up the storyboard, the graphics of like describing all this to us. Can you talk a little bit about, now that we're seeing the whole picture here of the architecture, can you talk a little bit more about the architecture and materiality yeah. form, like why, why does it look the way it looks? Mm -hmm. I mean, I understood the part about the hive making, but it's, it's different than that in a way. Um, so the materiality really was inspired by bee products such as honey and wax. Um, so very interested in the, the translucency of wax um, and the, the kind of tint and uh, transparency and translucency of honey. Um, so a lot of the glazing in the building um, uses a polycarbonate facade system. Um, and in the, the honey volume, honey tasting volume here, um, it uses laminated glass that has a, an orange tint which wraps inside of the building. Um, and, and it, 
creates this feeling that you're almost encapsulated in honey. Um, and uh, the inside of the building is, is uses a lot of bright materials so that it glows from the outside when you look through it uh, from this kind of transparent uh, polycarbonate uh, facade material. I just had this image of Pooh Bear. Um, there's this one video where he's swimming in honey. <laughs> As you say, in caps of honey, that made me honestly think of him. Um, I don't think you have to be quite so literal um, with the honey, it, with it everywhere in Zyra is the only color. Um, the only other thing also I think of is I love raw honey. It isn't clear, right? It's not processed and it's, um, you can't see through it. Uh, so you might want to play with that, you know, just the different and levels and, and grades of it. Because I think yeah. there's a lot more depth to it mm -hmm. um, that you might be missing out yeah. for it that could relate to and translate into the architecture. Um, Okay, so I by default know a lot about honey and beekeeping. My husband and I have two hives at home. Um, we are, I guess you would call town beekeepers, not urban beekeepers, but um, yeah, we started them maybe six years ago and have experienced, you know, the hive die off, um, issues with hives. We understand a lot about beekeeping now. Um, but just amazing creatures. If you don't know about bees, please look into them. They are amazing. Um, they also help support our life, so we should do a better job of supporting theirs. Um, there are a lot of great programs, and you've probably come across these. So, so like E Love, I think that's in Chicago or Detroit. They take um, so they it's urban beekeeping, but um, they reintroduce and provide employment for people who have been incarcerated. Um, to sell honey and the other um, and other um, you know lotions, other things, but it's all um, to help them get back on their feet. And all the bees are. It's just a nice story because the bees are are foraging from kind of leftover spaces in the urban environment, but creating you know great, wonderful natural products from that. And it, it's just a window. So I think you know there are opportunities there. Um, there. You know, it's not just about honey, of course, right. the beeswax and other things that can do it. I liked, um, you know, the community outreach. I love seeing the, you know, kids being involved. I love that graphic with all the displays. Maybe it's not the same display over and over again in reality, but, um, you know, that it's down at their level okay. and they can be engaged in it. Um, but I think also, you know, promoting that the public can come in and learn about beekeeping because it's, Although it is, I will say, it takes a certain knowledge base. You have to educate yourself. So I think the center would be great. I think it's something that anybody with group access could, could take on and do, and it would help out a lot. Um, yeah, and you know, I, mean, I think the, the reclamation of the water as well as helping the bee population, what a wonderful thing. And just to go beyond that, I would say, Phenomenal graphics. Um, you know, I think I saw you in the spring semester of the planning studio, maybe a while ago. Did you do it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I saw some of your graphics during that, and we'll say that you've excelled beyond that at this point. Um, and, you know, just beautiful illustrations and taking infographics to the next level and just the merging of before and after. Beautiful. Um, I also would commend you on the urban planning that you've kind of almost, it's almost understated in your presentation, but I look at it and the sophistication of the reclamation and the spaces. My only comment would be, you know, you're doing a lot of the zigzag back to the urban grid. I think a lot of people would want to walk along the waterfront uninterrupted. So maybe connecting some of those would have been good. It's a very minor comment. So um, I would say overall, I'm um, impressed with the work here. And I think um, the architecture for the center, um, you know, is iconic. It's memorable. Um, it is a civic space. So I think you have a lot of play in that. I mean, I would hope that if we saw some of these other buildings, they would be more like the rest of the fabric. They would be background buildings or soldiers, as some of my previous professors would have said here. Uh, they don't all need to be iconic, but I think you have liberty here to explore that. Uh, so can you 
you speak a little bit about the landscape design? You've obviously been influenced by Highline. You have a beautiful display here. I actually can't see the white on orange flavors. Um, so if you could describe some of that a little bit more, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, so the Esplanade that wraps the canal has, has these loops that reach into, into the park. Um, and these are kind of pollinator hotspots um, planted with uh, uh, planting schemes that uh, promote pollination using native plants um, and trees. Um, and uh, the, the wetlands uh, along the, the, the canal edge um, provide um, uh, kind of marsh uh, landscapes that, that relate back to what the, the uh, canal was before it was a canal. Um, and let's see, uh, there's floating wetlands in the canal to help cleanse uh, uh, some of the contaminants. Um, uh, so, so your landscape isn't bee focused, only your um, site, particular site is for the bees? No, so each one of these are a pollinator hotspot. Okay. Um, so they'll, they'll have plants that promote um, uh, bee pollination. Okay. And then there's also uh, kind of urban um, orchards as well, um, moving outside of the softened edge um, to, to further help uh, bee pollination efforts. Can you tell us a little more about the architectural um, details that I, I guess we see best when we have the right? Here, um, the forms, the way the undersides are uh, curved. Um, so initially, they were these rectilinear volumes that were very much like um, the architecture of a hive. Um, I think as the project developed, uh, the edges started to become sculpted and curved um, to 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 really reference um, softness and the, the malleability of honey, wax, and things like that. Um, I think uh, it also helped uh, the building feel less rigid and kind of blend into the softness of some of the landscape uh, elements that were, that were designed uh, as well. So, um, I guess I do really like all of the graphics. I guess the, I was just going to ask to see a plan on the first floor that really shows more of the site and how the building interacts with it, I guess maybe it just doesn't read very well. Yeah, it's a little, and, little yeah, light. I'm sorry. Now I'm going to do it. Yes. <laughs> push me over there. Push me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really curious about just the quality of the quality of these spaces um, because you do have these kind of looming volumes. That's not there. They seem to be high enough, so um, there's uh, less concern. But I'm just curious about this. I'm dying for an image that looks down. Um, the long yeah. shot down here. Oh, I think yeah. you've cheated yourself by only showing us one um, really nice, big, stunning view and put it all the way over there um, where I think we could have used a few more of those shots because that one, as the terminus of whatever road this is, I think would be a really yeah. powerful statement to be in, in this urban place and have that. I agree. That's, that's probably the next step that I would have taken is looking at some of the, the other views. Um, a lot of the views are from the, the, the park, um, but I think that would have been the next step. Just, just to echo that, to kind of build up to that, the, um, I, mean, I also like that there's like the green roofs on this, some of these buildings that, you know, that the pollination is occurring at a building scale. I, I started wondering, like, and I had, again, I know nothing about bees, so that probably would kill all the bees by doing this, but if you like, I can imagine like, what if the facade like was had bees in it or something? You know, like if you use polycarbonate, it has like a grid or whatever. You like, you could literally look, be looking through, you know, through um, the glass surface or one surface of it. So there's just like another level of like kind of either eroding or like detail adding information to this that I think would be really interesting to explore. That that you could be interfacing with the bees and with the the sequence or the what, what happens, you know, the story of that more richly. I don't I know that's a lot to get to, like you have, you don't start to really program the exhibits and things, but I think it could be part of the architecture in an interesting way. 
I, I agree, and, and early on I had a, an idea of, of using the facade element. Um, there was, a, I think it's a King of Kuma building that has this um, kind of lattice green walls uh, that line the facade. Um, and I was also thinking of how maybe some of the hives could actually um, penetrate into the wall and become part of that wall section. Um, didn't really pan out that way, but I think those are uh, definitely interesting ideas that um, could be considered. I think you have the viewing, you should have a picture of, of viewing um, hives. You know, I just like, could it live in the, in the section of the like, glazing or something? Right, right. I don't know. I, I like the uh, comprehensive nature of your investigation, your thesis from, from an urban design. This is couch as an urban design, as well as the landscape, wonderful landscape design, and then of course the architecture portion. So I like that, that you've integrated all those realms or scales of design to make a wonderful, I think very wonderful presentation and project. I think you were very successful there. I have a couple of questions. One is, what is the relationship between water and bees? Is there, do bees depend on, on this canal? Or does the canal depend on the bees? Is there uh, some kind of symbiotic connection there? So, so bees require water. Um, so the canal would provide water for the bees. Um, and then, the, although the wetland plants, a lot of the wetland plants do not require bees as their pollinator, a lot of the, they require pollination. So all the pollinators, such as birds and insects, would pollinate the wetland portion, but the dry areas would be pollinated by the bees, um, as well as other insects and uh, birds as well. Um, but so there is this kind of relationship that uh, the canal provides something for the bees, um, and then the bees provide something for the canal as well. Um, and then how do we get here? Do we drive here? We walk here? We bicycle here? How, how does that work? So if I want to visit your center. Um, there is a, a, a subway, this is a uh, elevated subway line uh, above the canal. Um, there's a stop here, uh, the F&G line. Um, there's another stop um, or up, off the, off the uh, page here. And then there's a, a, a track that runs um, along the, the eastern um, edge of the canal as well. Um, and then you could drive. Um, there's street parking on pretty much all of the streets. A lot of them are one way with street parking on both sides. Um, and then I think right now, it, or as the canal exists, it's not a very walkable canal. There aren't a lot of crossing um, elements, but there's uh, additions of um, pedestrian um, uh, crossing uh, bridges, um, which will improve connection across the canal. So I think it. There, it is now kind of a walkable um, area as well with the, the esplanade. Um. One, one last question. What happens between your buildings? The little nooks and, and head heights and between, because you, you've created an architecture that has a negative space, right? A bunch of negative space. What happens in that negative, in those negative spaces? Um, so, for example, here, this is uh, a demonstration area um, in a, kind of an outdoor terrace um, underneath the, the high volume, which has, that, again, that glass that wraps under. Um, so it's this highly reflective ceiling um, for the outdoor uh, space. So you could show have demonstrations for school kids um, that come in and um, you teach them how uh, some of the processes of agriculture. Um, and then others um, are actually interior spaces that are enclosed, um, that just have... The negative spaces in plan, what, what happens there? Um, so, for example, there's a negative space... Um, for instance, a space between one and two. There's a space that looks, appears to be yes. within yeah. one and yeah. two, all of those spaces. Yeah. Um, so that's open to below. Um, and so this, this volume kind of floats out, um, and that's the volume you move under and between the two buildings and it creates that threshold. Um, this is uh, for the labs. These are actually outdoor um, hives. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a terrace area. Um, so if you look here, um, it's not very clear, but you would have a, like maybe one or two hives up here. Um, there's a, a thick wall for these labs that where you can um, move from inside to outside, um, 
and it's kind of a two door system where you don't let bees inside, um, so you move through two doors and there's that, that middle space. Um, and then there, there's hives out here where you can actually kind of take care of them, use, use them to bring inside for research, um, or bring the research outside to those, to those outside spaces. It's interesting for me, I, you know, the fact that you ask about those things. Uh, it seems that each, you know, that you've made these modules, but they're not just the, the regular uh, container, you know, um, structure that people, you know, get and just sort of plug them in. It, it's almost like uh, on an architectural scale, that, for instance, Apple design each one of those and you can expand. And I, I, and I like that about this, that you, you have this uh, quality and this sort of language that is not only in the architecture, it's in the landscape, it's in how things move around, even in these components uh, here, and even the way you present it is very elegant. I mean, if, if, you were, you know, if you were a jazz musician, you would say you have a really good voice, but it's going on, and a uh, good language, so I, I think it's great. There can even be more of that, like where you're, um, particularly this, these, these four pieces right here, you know, I'm just looking at even at the site plan, the way this is kind of opened up, I mean, could these things start to bend out and like shape them? Because they're, because they're kind of isolated, like the space between them doesn't have to be uniform each time, and it could, it could react more to the landscape around it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Um, to a certain extent. So these, these initially, <laughs> these initially uh, were developed as these cells, um, which kind of relates to uh, you know, bees um, and the honeycomb that they produce. So they, they were very regular elements. Um, throughout the entire semester, I was struggling with, do I, do I kind of, and pluck this out or twist it uh, to the landscape or do I keep it all kind of rigid and, and cell-like almost where you plug these into a very rigid um, grid system. And, and again, with, with these being in the grid, um, I, I felt like it, it wanted to be more regular. But there, I, there were schemes where, where this actually got kind of twisted and these became articulated in different ways that, that provide a little more dynamism. But, I think at the end of the day, I rever reverted back to more uh, conservative, but it was something that I definitely played with throughout the entire semester. Can you just talk about the structure of those hive things? Because, you know, actually, I, I guess when you when you're talking about the grid and I've seen them there, they almost look like um, little buoys out in the water. And I actually think I might like them not on a grid out there now, given that that building is so strongly orthogonal and on this grid. Yeah, maybe they do something different. I'm also just curious about the height of those and what drives that. Is that purely you thought you wanted something tall and sculptural out there? Or is there a reason they need to lift up? Um, yes, uh, I think they um, want it to be a sculptural element so that um, they signal from different points along the canal that uh, this is kind of a almost a sculpture park, but it's really um, an, an apiary park. Um, the height also uh, wants to separate the bees from humans a little bit, so that people aren't messing with the hives and you know smashing them or something. Um, so you you want a little separation. You can actually look up at them um, instead of kind of look straight at them. You can actually look up and see. Um, so this hive is different than the hive, the Langstroth hive that I showed you, which uses a, a frame where, where bees actually uh, fill their honey. Um, these just use a top part um, where bees extrude in a, in a free-form manner their, their honeycomb. Um, and so that's why you kind of want to look up at them. Um, and then uh, it's on this pulley system where um, it can be raised up um, if there's no uh, bees in the hive. Not each of these hives will be have bees at all times. Um, one of the ideas is that the bees that are uh, kept in these can actually be bought. Um, so when you start keeping bees, you need to buy bees. You, you can't just um, you know catch them or something on your own. So so. so it, <laughs> So, so these, kind of, these, as well as the observation hives in the building, become a bee sanctuary that actually promote um, people who want to become beekeepers um, as well. And so when there's no bees in here, you could lift it up, and that kind of signals that. Um, that one's empty. 
that are built. Okay. Yeah. I can add a separate reason. Um, bees, when they come out of the hives, go. they, they yeah. circulate around and they go kind of monodirectional. So you don't want people standing right at the throat right. of a, a bee hive because yeah. then they're seeing bees come out of them. So having raising them up, it gives you that visual of the stalagmites, stalactites, whatever hangs from the ceiling of the cave. It looks like them. It has an interesting structure, but also just the path of the uh, coming out. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very good point, and that's something I thought of. Um, so the, the bee entry, um, there's a, a void in the top where ideally bees would fly up and out. Um, so there's a bee fly zone that's above the, the human height. Um, so yeah, very good. This is a, this is a wonderful thesis um, and really well done. I have two questions. Is there a mechanical system for this building? And if so, where is it? <laughs> and my second question is, is there a structural system in, uh, under the tasting that traces down through the building and where is it? Yeah. So the, the structure, um, it uses these super columns um, that lift up um, and go all the way down to, the, to level one. Um, and then this cantilever uses a, a Virendel truss. Um, uh, so it's a rigid truss um, element. Um, I want to ask you a question about that. How important is that candle to the design? Um, your, your, your structural engineer is going to tell Yeah, you. yeah, he's probably told me that. that these of course, you're yeah. going to create tension in the foundation here, and that's going to be a big, expensive problem. Because this is doing that. It's worth it. You know, but it, it, it's, it's OK if that's really important. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the mechanical um, is is on the first floor. Um, so there's a service core um, on the urban side of the building on the first floor with uh, service access um, as well as mechanical system. Um, this building uses geothermal um, based on the, the, the water and the ground. Um, I think it can capture a lot of the, the Heat exchange there. Um, yeah. Herbert, you, your section could have explained a whole lot of the questions that people have raised. That section should have been proud over here in the middle of the presentation because it, it explains all those negative spaces that you have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, I have a question. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm sure that you at some point investigated a hexagonal plan or shape or anything, or did you just steer clear of that? I avoided that completely. Yeah, and, and Almost, yeah, it didn't want to be too literal. Too literal. Okay. Yeah. Just had an ask. I want to build on that point. Um, I think there's ways to do it not so literally using hexagonal planning schemes, but kind of frankly, right, who's, it doesn't have to turn out looking like a beehive, but you have those very dynamic data lines. And um, I think that, I, I, that was the first thing I thought when I looked at this project, that, you know, what a, what a cool opportunity if you're gonna go with a yellow materiality, frankly, right, hexagonal planning. Um, I think I didn't necessarily want to do that in plan. I think uh, by softening some of the edges of the volumes, um, it, it lends itself to kind of a hexagonal um, uh, form um, without actually being this rigid hexagonal. Um, so it, it references it without without being an hexagonal. But. How do you do that hexagonal? You, you could have done it out in the landscape or such a super scale that it is not obvious, right? But that a lot of people do through the site. Like, why do why do they why do the bees use the hexagonal form? It must be something right. about structure. structure. So if there was a way to use it structurally, mm -hmm. you could it would make sense to introduce it, but to just use it visually yeah. doesn't right. it doesn't really tie in an authentic way. I would 
Okay, great. Um, I'm uh, James Tillman. I'm, I'm chair of this committee, and I, I have to say I've really enjoyed this dialogue, as I knew I would. Um, and in particular, the last part of the dialogue, where most of you were taking a run at the tectonic suggestiveness of this subject. And so, which, which brings me to my first um, set, of, set of comments for you. Um, it's truly been a pleasure to work with you this semester, and it's been a heck of a lot of fun. Um, I'm actually allergic to bee stings. And <laughs> as a result of this project, um, I'm not allergic anymore. And so that's kind of a magic thing. But the first thing I wanted to say, which is a, which is a, a little bit of a pun, of course, this is your be all and end all. And the cue for the audience is to roll your eyes, right? But that's precisely the point. Precisely the point. Because this project shows such discipline and such restraint and a desire to deal with the architectural solution in a very studied and very disciplined manner. And I really have to commend you for developing that discipline over the course of the semester. Um, and there's lots to, to love uh, about the architectural solution, but, and yet, I think you showed an enormous amount of discipline in how you approached the, the tectonic language of this project. And again, I want to commend you on that. Um, in the context of the conversation this afternoon, interestingly enough, I think this is an infrastructural project of which the architecture is merely the flowering forth of an infrastructural solution in which, in this case, a natural agent has been set loose in the urban environment in a very unironic way and provided with the support system in all of the natural environments that you've investigated that actually support the fundamental proposition of this, of this natural agent. So in that, in that sense, I think it is, it's a, a transcendent project, and I have to commend you on, this, on the strength of, of, of that um, accomplishment. Um, finally, uh, just a couple of specific comments about trying to figure out how to get bees to, to crawl into the walls of the building. I think it would be a mess. Um, but I think you, you know, I mean, is this not enough? to be able to, to, to see that and experience that. So it sort of gets back to this, this question of, of, of discipline. And so, again, I'm, I'm commending you for that. So, um, finally, uh, just on a personal note, um, you arrived here three years ago. Um, I had you in a drawing class, Architecture 443. I subsequently had you as a student in Graduate Studio 3, Architecture 406, and finally in the uh, Pro Thesis semester. And um, one of the profound pleasures of, of teaching is to observe the development of a student from the very first exercise we did in the drawing class, which is freehand circles in a grid on a piece of paper, not hexagons. Um, and to, to see you arrive at this, this point is, is truly one of the high points of any, any teaching career. So, um, Trevor, I want to wish you all the best and every success as you go forward. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow morning, 10 a.m.